Welcome everyone. My name is Matt Presty. I'm here with J.B. Yount III, uh, author of Remembered for Love, the book uh, biography of Leo Russell. Uh, good afternoon. How are you? you? It's so good to see you again. It's great to see you again too. Thank you. Indeed. Um, well, we have so much to talk about. Um, a lot of people have been getting more and more interested in the Russells over the past few years, um, in part due to uh, a lot of people um, just finding the works of these two illuminates. A, a good deal of us do your good work. Well, thank you, thank you. It's, I, it's, uh, I've followed it and admired it tremendously because it's so important with us not permanently at Swanamilla now right. to see that the work has expanded. And that was the important thing for both the Russells. Absolutely. And, uh, a lot of people have taken a bigger and bigger interest in Leo, especially. Um, Robert and I stress a lot that uh, Leo's part in this is so important to the re-delivery efforts of this message. And, and being that, that you were so close to her and, and as such did the uh, biography and whatnot, um, I guess we'd like to center around that work a little bit. And uh, let's start with a, a question. Um, um, when did you first meet Walter and Leo? If you could tell us a little bit about that. I met them, interestingly enough, on the very day that they dedicated Swanamilla, mm -hmm. which was in May, I believe, of 1949. They'd come in uh, 48 and spent a furtive seven or eight months just bringing it back virtually from ruin. And they dedicated it that day. The president of the University of Virginia was their former governor mm -hmm. who uh, spoke as the keynote speaker. I was a young boy in the, I guess, fourth or fifth grade. And I never got out of school. I was going to a parochial school here. Never got out of it for anything except a dental appointment. And I was most surprised when my father came and announced that I'd be getting out of school that afternoon. That, <laughs> He wanted to take me to the dedication of Swatanoa. And he was so keenly interested in it because actually his father had owned the farm up there when it was just a place that we had family farms back still have it. And in those days, most of the farmers had a mountaintop place they'd take the cattle during the summer. And my dad's older brothers and ox teams would come, oxen teams would drive the cattle up the perimeter of Waynesboro to the top of the mountain and we have newspaper clippings of picnics up there and, and music cows they had back in 1908 or so and he sold it, grandfather sold it to uh, Major Dooley in 1908 it was built. So all through the years my father practiced law here and he was always quite keenly interested needless to say when when the Dooleys were up there living, living the gilded age life of, of the millionaires that they were and when the uh, when later it was a country club and President Coolidge and his wife stopped and, and were serenaded by local bands and taken up there for I believe it was a Thanksgiving all of that interested him and of course he was somewhat sad during the Second World War when it got to a point where of course, with gas shortage and all of it, no tourists. And I think Richard's grandfather, Richard Delaney's grandfather and, and his uh, colleagues owned it then. And, and they took good care of it, but it, it wasn't occupied. And it, it, there was an effort to market it for an arts and sciences uh, center, and, but no takers. This was during the war. Sure. And then the Russells came in 1948. That's the story in itself, which mm -hmm. I'm sure you have read in her little blue brochure how they searched on the, really on their honeymoon right. all across the country where a place where they could establish the uh, a place the uh, people might learn about the science of man, which right. they felt was the most misunderstood. Which Alexis Carroll in the, in the Twilight Club thought exactly. would be a good thing to start exactly. back in the 20s. Man, the unknown uh, author. And anyway, uh, so now, so I went up there that afternoon. I've certainly gotten around the bush going back two generations. That's typical of a Virginian to do that. <laughs> but but 
I remember just as well going, and you know, this is the time before television. So when we go up on the mountain and we turn the corner and that gleaming white palace is there, I'd never seen it before. And in we go, and big multitude of people. And we of course went through the receiving line. And Dr. Russell, I remember, of course, he was up in years and he was, he was uh, sort of the center of attention that day to say the least. And I, I was very much in awe of him. But Mrs. Russell, of course, had the charm that so many hundreds of thousands came to know in the later years, and she charmed me at once. And I might say she charmed my father, because within a week, uh, he was her local attorney and wow. a very good friend for really for uh, the rest of his life. And so we, we came to know her very well. She was, uh, I hate to put it quite this way, because there's much I could have learned that I suppose I didn't learn until I researched her biography, but she was more, it was just like a kind, wonderful aunt to me. I can remember conversations all through the years. Before I was on the board, she asked me to be on the board in the, I believe it was the early 80s, but I represented her after my father had died in local legal matters, and sure, there were always one problem or another, with, if, if only with trespassers up there on that remote mountain. But anyway, we were very, very devoted friends. And my sister, who passed away some years ago and was older than I was, was very, very close to her too, very fond of her. So she, of course, she was like nobody else uh, we found around Waynesboro. Sure. She left quite an impression when she would sweep down into Waynesboro in the big car with Dr. Russell and go into a, either go to the post, it's just going to the post office was done dramatically if you, if, if, if you can imagine her. And, but she was, she was fundamental and she was basic and she had very little uh, effort at, uh, and making an impression, she just did what did that naturally. That sure. just came naturally, because she was always interested in the person, the shyest person in the room. All through the years, when people would come on Sunday afternoon, she would receive people in the great hall at Swannanoa. She would always, incredibly, uncannily, be able to pick out the most modest, shy least likely to want to be interviewed or talked to in the person in the room and go right to them and win them over and some of some of the great uh, friendships of her latter years were were those type people so that's where I met her I'll never forget of course that day and uh, that was well 1948 mm -hmm. that was 60 five years ago, so there are not a whole lot of us who were, <laughs> who were up there that day. I've even got Richard B. to a good deal. His grandfather, of course, was there. Right. But, but it, uh, it's certainly a time I won't forget. And mm -hmm. as the, the, through developed through the life, my life, um, I remember so well my mother gave me as a gift graduating from our military school here, a uh, copy of God Will Work With You, but not for you. Wow. That was uh, her first book, you know, and then the New York Times, New York Herald Tribune mm -hmm. listed it as one of the top 10 uh, nonfiction books of the year, I believe 55. Excellent. And then even before that, I was given the man who tapped mm -hmm. as an encouragement to cut the grass the way Dr. Russell did by pattern, geometric pattern and, and artistically, so it wasn't so much a burden on a Saturday morning. <laughs> so, make, make your work fun. Absolutely, words, yeah. that's right in that book. I, uh, I, it was hard lesson to teach me. But I sort of learned it, and I have to say, when I was cutting that big old lawn over 
at our old home place, I did often think, well now how, <laughs> how can I do this geometrically and how can I do it in a, in a way that is not just cutting the grass? I, I find myself doing the same thing at, at the house. Yeah. I, I try to make a spiral cut as opposed to just back and forth. Exactly. So I, I, I end up messing up the whole yard, but it, it eventually gets cut, but I'll figure it out one day, I think. Lori knows this. <laughs> um, Walter said of Leo that, that she, she was the most clairvoyant person he had ever known. Absolutely. Uh, can you tell us anything that, that she might have shown or demonstrated to you that, that uh, makes that a true statement? Any recollections or memories of her clairvoyance in action? Well, it, it, when you think so, it's, she didn't do it so much to uh, to impress, but impress a natural, function and she didn't do it so much to solve a specific problem or where is this or sure what happened there, but she was she was so her sensitivity was just beyond uh, beyond any question, and, I, and her sister when she came. To Swan and Noah would tell about Leo as a little girl. Now, some of those stories are in the book. Right. Repeated and how she would uh, just demonstrate leadership among a, a sofa full of dolls and uh, go across the street with her dogs. Where and I've been to the little town in the town, a beautiful little town in uh, uh, the Midlands of England, and it's probably. Uh, a lot more beautiful today than it was then when it was a hard working mm -hmm. place. But there was a large hundred and some acre pasturage that had been donated to the town right across the street mm -hmm. from from Holocaub Cottage where she was born right. and where her grandfather had a number of tenants uh, houses. And she would take her collie and, and the other dog and go across the street and and just and be in the different worlds. Mm -hmm. And and perhaps that's not a, uh, a good demonstration of it. But through the years before she met Dr. Russell, it was pretty obvious um, she had enormous sensations, which she recorded in some yet unpublished uh, diaries mm -hmm. of um, what was befalling some of her friends and actually some of her uh, close companions who were in the service during the World War II. Right. One never returned, one to whom she was probably quite devoted just mm -hmm. six months or so before she met Dr. Russell. Right. And, and she just had a sensation in that little apartment up in Boston. She, I went to that place once where she had her illumination right. back in the 1946. And, and it, uh, it's incredible that all that could have happened in that it's a very beautiful little apartment on sort of near Boston Commons. But, of course, the war was on and she was... Uh, very distraught over not just this friend, but certainly this uh, friend who was an officer in the ar in the armed services, and he never came back, right. and and that that led to a real outpouring of of uh, soul searching, I suppose you'd say. But but she had an enormous affinity. I guess I'm beating around the bush too much. It, it probably the biggest demonstration I saw of it. People who would come there, and, and this is recorded throughout the uh, files, because when she ever answered someone's letter, there, there, there might be sort of a, you might say, form letter. Mm -hmm. But if that individual had mentioned having a, an afflicted child, or having a problem with uh, a, a sensitivity on her, uh, in her own uh, dealings with people, sure. there'd be a unique response. Mm -hmm. and, and those unique responses all put together, I, I think, if anything, gives my book a, a flavor. Mm -hmm. It's repeating those things because they were one of a kind for individuals. But she could tell what was bothering you. And 
even if you didn't tell her, mm -hmm. she could pretty much advise you as to how you might find your way with the world right. a happier way and a, and a better way and one in which you could and of course it's all very simple as as, as she would say in the, in the uh, science and action of loving one another mm -hmm. very <laughs> she, well. she talked about that all oh so much and and there was nothing phony nothing spiritual nothing lofty in the sense that she was a hard worker. She worked as hard as anybody. I mean, even when she was up in years, mm -hmm. she may not have done the, to the guards and what Margaret and other girls up there did to bring the beauty out, but she certainly was was there and, and very much hands on. And, and I think one of the saddest things I learned about her when she was, uh, when I was doing research on the book, and there were so many files and, and, and copies of letters and responses, is back during the time when Dr. Russell was in his last year or two. And he, he was an older man, he was 90 years old, and while his mind was, was alert, uh, the Bible, I think, says the flesh is weak. And, she would describe many and many a time, and she's done it to me personally as well as in correspondence, how she would spend all night practically keeping him, maybe changing the, the when he'd have sweats and all, of the, right. you know, this natural uh, problems, changing the beds two or three times and uh, trying to cool him and soothe him, mm -hmm. and then spend the day uh, greeting people and, and right. answering correspondence. And she always answered anything that was the least personal, sure. that couldn't be answered by her beautifully done uh, general mm -hmm. paragraphs. She answered personally and individually. Well, I know uh, two gentlemen by the name of uh, Jim Porter and, and John Bosnell, uh, told me that they were there on staff mm -hmm. from 78 to 80, somewhere in mm -hmm. those years. And Jim said that oftentimes he would go to bed after uh, 16 hours of working with her and she'd stay up another four hours and continue to work. So he would, you know, he's a strapping young lad of 18, 19 years old and he would be so worn out that he would have to go off to bed. And, and she was in her sentence. Yeah, and she would she just work, look him, work him into the ground, he said. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's amazing how you know, in that sense, people who who have that much light are able to go that long, 18 to 20 hours a day of work. And did you find it hard to keep up with her yourself? Oh <laughs> I don't think I ever really kept up with her. <laughs> she was very tolerant, and and uh, and, and as, you know, she treated. She was very close to my father. Mm -hmm. My mother had died, and she uh, and she always was just wonderful to me. And and. I always did everything I, I could do. She was one of those. She's been in this house, interestingly enough, really? not when I was living here. And I, wow. moved, I moved in in 77. But the original owner, uh, she, she was actually here in the house when they first came to town. The Russells found, and this is in the book too, that they were, of course, beset from all sides by invitations to waste an evening over cocktails or, over, or you know, conversation, and then didn't have time to do it. Right. She was corresponding with people all around the world, and he, he was still doing experiments right. and, and all with, with some great uh, scientists whom you know well about, and, and you, you know, they, they needed the quiet and peace of the mountaintop to tune in to things a little more interesting than what was the lo local gossip in Waynesboro. Sure. But she did in the very early days. In fact, she used to always love to tell me 
and she came once since I was sitting here on a, on a quick survey, but she used to tell me that she had been here on several occasions when she first came to Waynesboro, mm -hmm. and so she knew the house very well. Dr. Russell would say there was a grand piano in the living room, which the original owners took, and uh, she, they had played, he had, the doctor played that. There's a fascinating wow. story in the book about the, you probably possibly recall, when they first came to town, there was sort of a new country club here, mm -hmm. um, an old barn had been refurbished, it was very nice, <coughs> excuse me, there was a cotillion each year, and they were invited to the cotillion. And she was, this is a, a sad commentary in a way on people who weren't quite up to relating to Ms. Russell and the doctor, but uh, they were invited and they came in the afternoon of the dance. A friend of Dr. Russell's, whom he had known in Europe, on the, uh, from Europe, he was mm -hmm. from Europe, sure. um, had come uh, from Washington and they said, well, we're invited to a dance and all, and, and he said, well, he had his formal clothes. Mm -hmm. So they called and asked if they could bring us down. They came, Dr. Russell, a much younger Mrs. Russell, and a, this very gentlemanly, suave, suspicious-looking European. <laughs> and um, in the middle of the whole dance, Dr. Russell said, and now, my lovely Leo, will demonstrate the tango for which she received an award back in the 30s on the, I believe it was at one the Pans in, on the Riviera. In the year, right. And um, so of course it wasn't anything to do, Ms. Russell, Russell was in a red dress and all, <coughs> and they must have executed it beautifully. Well, it was the talk of the town for years and years and years, and of course, uh, it didn't affect us, but it, we sort of hated it that it was the talk of the town. But years later, one of the ladies who'd been there wanted to go up and see one of Ms. Russell's new rooms that she had decorated. So I, had, I was going up to get, and she was nice enough to invite them. And they went up, and in the course of conversation, this lady said, I remember shortly after you came to Waynesboro, I was a, a young bride and went to the country club and you had a beautiful red dress and you danced the tango and all. And Leo said, oh, I recall so well, I had never met this friend of the doctors who, who had come that afternoon. And of course, she was sort of put on the spot and, and uh, when he announced that they would dance the tango. And I thought, on the way back, this friend just shook her head. She said, how small-minded so many of us were right. to, to naturally think this was a inter, international menage you know, a trois, <laughs> you know, and nothing further from the truth. Right. So needless to say, they, they didn't just, didn't, they, they were very cordial and lovely to everyone they met here, mm -hmm. but they, they, they had more lofty goals and more lofty challenges than uh, socializing local, locally. Mm -hmm. Now she had a, a special knack for children who would just oh, instantaneously no basically rush her at the door. Mm -hmm. so. they, they really did. It was amazing. Well, I was one that did right. it as hard as it is to believe. Back, back in 1949, uh, up there, I, re I recall she just took to me right away. And, and I wasn't alone, of course. But she was, it was phenomenal how she did that. She had friends, whole families of people who became very close to her. We had professors at UVA who had th three or four children, and and they were and, and some of the people who who were in, I guess you'd say housekeeping capacity up there, and had children. That she her happiest Christmases after the doctor died certainly were was when uh, some of the housekeepers' family, maybe their grandchildren or even children, would come up there. They, they'd, 
there'd be a room full of children under a tree and a little something for everybody. Wow. And she would, would uh, have her chance to, to give good advice to these, you know, young kids, children. She had a most phenomenal personality. Mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think one of the most amazing things to me was the, what I used, I don't know how dramatically it came out, as the very last thing in the book, in, in her biography. She had grown up, of course, there in the uh, Midlands of England and had the good opportunity, well, her parents had died quite young, and she was reared by a very intelligent and, and uh, somewhat strict older sister, mm -hmm. Flory. Flory, right. And, and Flory was, was the business manager of, of a large wholesale concern. But the, the area was, was just filled with Rothschild mansions. Right. It, it, it was, uh, there are not many of them there. A lot of them have been torn down, you know, because they were not the really old English houses. Waddleston Manor is still there. But, and, and don't think she worked there. But the, there was a, one called Tring, and she wound up first a, as a, a secretary, just when I mean, she was very young, right. and then as a uh, social secretary with one of the Rothschilds that she always said, that it, it's often told, not just me, but others, that naturally she learned an awful lot of how to move in any society with those people. They were the wealthiest people mm -hmm. and probably the most culturally uh, deft in, in, in England or at the time other than I suppose the royal family, they were right on. I believe one of those, as she used to tell the story, one of those uh, ladies whom she knew had a gorgeous uh, garden that probably out right. did Buckingham Palace or Windsor, <laughs> and Queen Victoria came to see it, came to visit, and stepped on one of the ro rose things, and Miss Rothschild <laughs> said, you were scared off of this, move, move immediately. And, you know, in those days, apparently, nobody did that to Queen Victoria, but <laughs> so those, that was quite an experience. And, and, and she, she went through all of that, and then, of course, she started a business in England, which was, I thought, tied beautifully in with, with the work she later did with Dr. Russell. Mm. She, it, it, was a, it was a beauty business. Skin creams. And, and yeah. she didn't create those. Uh, she had Italian chemists. Mm. But she never sent a beauty. It was the largest uh, home mail order beauty business in England. Right. I've been right in the bottom of the uh, British Library, the new British Library, and gone through page after page of the pulp magazines of the 1920s and 28 and 30s, as well as the high, higher toned and mm -hmm. and and those uh, uh, advertisements were in all of those magazines. Your book lists several of the pictures. Yes, yes. They actually used and movie stars and all of them. her picture as yes, the right. promotional material exactly. in the ad. Yeah. Well, I guess she, that was about as. And we have a lot of those those uh, in the files up there and all, but uh, she was, of course, a, a very good advertisement for beauty. <laughs> but she always, these courses that she would send out, always stressed mm -hmm. that it was not the superficial, not the external, but it all true beauty mm -hmm. came from within. Right. And came from your the way you treated other people and the way you reacted with other people and the way you gave of yourself to other people. So she she stressed beauty throughout her life and she she lived it and, and always seemed to be a part of it with the cosmetics and, and creating the business in the beginning. But All not a way. vanity, not a vanity right. type. Right. Right. And, but the, and the inner beauty, I guess, yeah, and then would later express itself through the, the home study course, course and work with Dr. Russell. So. Very, very obvious. Right. That uh, he had never promoted uh, any of his works, which mm -hmm. are somewhat esoteric, as, 
uh, you you seem to make them uh, very understandable in, your, in what your work you're doing now. But they're 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 esoteric. But she was marvelous in laying out uh, courses and pamphlets and all that would help. And I think it's so interesting. We've had people associated with the university who were insistent on the fact that she hadn't written any of this. Uh, of course, she didn't write before they met, but right. after The Secret of Light, she was very, very uh, instrumental. instrumental. Yeah, right. And I was so delighted to find several letters written by him to old friends of his. Where he, he regretted not putting her name on exactly. things that she helped with. Right? Exactly. Yes. And, and she, had, she had done this, and she had done that, and she had done the other. And this is not someone he was uh, n newly acquainted with, trying to, you know, build Leo up. So it did bother him to a degree that not, he would write about not it. Not the least, and he was writing to old friends right. who knew him and, and all. And, I mean, beauty, I, I want you to, to, I know you do understand the fact, but the beauty was not vanity. Sure, absolutely. The, the beauty was, was of the soul. trying to, of the soul, marvelously put. Right, right. And that's, that's what she worked hard to, to evoke, and I think really did. She did in such a marvelous way. She said once, uh, a beauty, or I believe it was Divine Elliot, you must know it, beauty in your soul until it becomes your nature. So it's, it's exactly. nature is beautiful, and, and so is man's soul. And she felt that the I think she felt the divine Iliad was probably the greatest. Uh, well, I don't know that she put it the greatest. She had a list of his books that she thought that it was the order you should read. Mm -hmm. But she was very very fond of the divine Iliad, mm -hmm. and and felt like that said so much of it. The, the, the Universal One, of course, is, is just a monumental book. He it is. modified it somewhat in sure. The Secret of Light. But you, I think, have, have and I, I say this in real sincerity, uh, you and I met, I guess, four years ago mm -hmm. on the, the front, the front porch, sort of, at right. Swannanoa. Uh -huh. And I'd met a number of people who were impressed with the Russell work and all, and I enjoyed their encounter. But I've been so impressed since then how you have uh, compartmentalized in very understandable and beautifully produced ways the uh, essence of these great books. I and, I th and I'm sure, I mean that quite sincerely, and I, I think it's done a wonder to promote the uh, knowledge mm. that is so important, it really is. They realized that the knowledge was, was, uh, would live far after them. Mm. And I think that it's, uh, when I look and see the One Heart organization, which are hundreds of people in this area, and not all of them knew the Russells, but a good many of them did, but the message is so much the same. Right. And with someone like Richard Delaney, uh, who, who it was was there as a Yale senior crossing right. the country with carloads of of, uh, of their books and hair longer than mine. That's yeah. exactly. <laughs> that isn't that a wonderful picture of him with, on the centennial of Doctor Rosen's death? And, yep. <laughs> but when you see him and so many others uh, doing the same work and promoting the same beautiful image. And then our University of Science and Philosophy, I, I feel, continues to do a good deal. Mm -hmm. We're keeping the work, works in print. We, uh, we have the opportunity to open a beautiful headquarters someday in Roanoke uh, okay. as a gift of one of our uh, colleagues. Mm -hmm. And that may, that may happen. It, it would be a marvelous way to produce a, a a place just like the mountain was sure. in, the, in the ages of Russells. But when you see that, and then people like you, and and I, I'm very uh, quick to comment on Joey Corn, who mm. I'm sure you know, I think yes. has done a wonderful job of promoting the Ian Jill. 
promoting the Russell works and and our friend Dagmar in Germany I mean it's being translated it's it's it can't be stopped we recently picked up a, a small team of people in the UK who wish to write a book that present the differences in the science from Universal One to the Secret of Light to a new concept of the universe and finally atomic suicide as a as a basically a, a Rosetta Stone of understanding mm -hmm. the differences in terminology in those few works. So a lot um, of it is terminology. Yes. And, and that's really getting to speak the same language mm -hmm. is, is a lot of the harder part. So I know, I know the the final distillation of the science and the philosophy occurred with the, the Magnum Opus atomic suicide. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the questions a lot of people ask us uh, is, do we know or does anybody know um, how, how the works are stored and, and, and if they're okay? And maybe to hear it from someone who, who has that insight is, is, is to, I know that it is going to go on display eventually again when the time is right, but, but are they okay? Is everything okay? And is it well, I guess the first thing we should talk about is the Christ of the Blue Ridge. Mm -hmm. The statue that was in the gardens there at right. the palace was in three or four uh, sections. Mm -hmm. And that it was a casting right. of, of, of the original clay molds mm -hmm. that the Russells did in the Great Hall. Mm -hmm. And and the... Um, I don't, um, I can assure you that while that casting out in the garden, I think most people know, collapsed unfortunately when it was moved at the right. request of the owners, uh, not, of, not of us, but of the people who uh, retained ownership after we left. But the uh, moles are still in the original, ones, okay. the original uh, top portion mm -hmm. which was on display in the uh, just off the old dining room mm -hmm. uh, th they're very carefully stored right. same with the with things like the uh, four freedoms right the other busts and stuff they've been very professionally Excellent. stored and the paintings the paintings, the paintings have okay. the um, archives uh, I went. To, I found them in very good shape Excellent. at the time I went through them, and of course, I've tried to to uh, make certain everything was returned and all. Mm -hmm. So, so we we're, we're not far from being in a position where we could easily uh, put a uh, study center right. to work. Right. And I hope perhaps someday that will be the, the case. There's a, a lot of excitement people have to want to see the works oh, again, no, hands know. on, and a, and a, with their own eyes and such. And ways. we've talked about perhaps doing those, uh, a few of the works here and there, and perhaps mm -hmm. in Akron, perhaps in Washington or New York. Or, you know, but it just never has. display. That's right, exactly, the exactly right. Museums around the country, the world even. But it, ha it just has the time, hasn't been to where it suited the, mm -hmm. the board to really do that. Right. But the um, those things are precious, of course. Sure. And they're, uh, we, we are more interested in preserving them sure. than, right. than anything else, really. Maybe, Maybe as the, the awareness grows and the demand for more uh, visual, first-hand encountering of, of the works. I know um, some of the students said that what was on display, which is a colossal amount of work at the university, mm -hmm. was actually only 2% of what Walter actually produced in his lifetime. Oh, is, that, sure. is that a pretty accurate statement? I'm say? certain of that. There was a lot of, th a lot of his, uh, I think we have most of his uh, final drafts and all, but there are a great deal of, of his early work, I'm, I'm sure that uh, I don't think I ever got into Carnegie Hall. It was right. still at the at the home, big home in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, if I'm not mistaken, the only one granddaughter, I believe, still living. And I think a lot of the work's been diffused. Mm -hmm. I know there are collectors. Sam uh, Spiker is one who, whenever he sees a 
a painting or something on the market, and they often are in the New York galleries. Wow. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen, I'd say I've seven. I've seen a few on eBay yeah. as well, but they're, but, they're pretty high priced. Yeah, in the spas, I've got the name of it, but I had a young friend who, who uh, worked as a curator in one of the galleries in New York City and they, they had three of their works at one time, they all sold, mm -hmm. as, as you say, for a high price. Right. Mm -hmm. And the ones on eBay are usually a little bit cheaper. Right. But uh, that, that's, <laughs> I suppose, the way of the world. But anyway, there's all I can tell you is there is care given. That's great. Naturally, there is a, a, some sensation in those who've been to Swatonoa that it would be a shame to have to move it somewhere else. Right. But they were never able, as you know, to buy Swatonoa. We leased it for 50 some years. Right. And it's not up to me to question Certainly. the desire of the uh, owners. The right. Delaney's uh, owned the property a lot longer mm -hmm. than the 50 years. Right. And, and they, they have a, a family heritage idea of it, which is, it has to be respected. Absolutely. And, and I had long conversations with, with them and other members of our board. On the other hand, I'm delighted at the fact that there's a potential for a beautiful site mm -hmm. in Roanoke as a, a, a home that uh, it's it's quite different from Swatonoa, mm -hmm. but it it uh, it holds its own. It reminds me very much of Hillwood, mm -hmm. the Meriwether Post home in Washington, which where all her Russian treasures are shown. A beautiful, somewhat. Uh, modern, I think it's post-1900, mm -hmm. Georgian, expansive Georgian house right. on a beautiful hilltop, wooded and all. So who knows, I, I, I may be, it may be in a later chapter right. than the one I, <laughs> what I figure in, but I believe that, that there's just too much interest and too much depth and importance in, in the tangible works as, are, as, as in the uh, theories sure. and the uh, sciences to suppress. It can't be, it can't be held in right. forever. And, right. and as you say, the work that's been done now, a good deal of it by you, is uh, a tremendous uh, it, it, just dramatic impetus to bring it forward to the public. It certainly has not been forgotten right. in the uh, 25 years since, since uh, that beautiful lady passed away. Mm -hmm. What would you say, having known Walter Russell personally, as, even as a young child, um, um, and, and a few people are, are left with us that actually you know, got to meet Walter, uh, what was your most memorable experience with Walter, even as, as a young man? You know, uh, what, what was your age when he, when he had passed away? And, and if you can recall what your fondest memory of I him was, was. Let's see, he died in 63, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that was the year I graduated from law school. Right. So I'd been busy during those seven years, but I was over in Charlottesville and it took many people up up to uh, Swannanoa. And of course, I knew Leo much better. Dr. Russell was a gentle, very, very quiet person in conversation. I was, uh, when I say quiet, he spoke softly. Mm -hmm. he, he, was, he was eloquent. He always made a point that was uh, profound and not what you normally read or thought. You, you always realized that you were talking with someone who uh, you should remember mm -hmm. that the conversation was worth recalling. But now when he spoke, even in the fairly later years, he was most dramatic, very dramatic in, in the, before a group of students and all. 
very nice uh, afterwards, uh, to escort them into dinner or to tea or something. But I, I mean, the amazing thing to me was was his absolute profound belief that uh, he understood the secret of the universe, and he understood. You, you, and I guess before we started this afternoon, expressed it so well in in, in the still small voice of God, mm -hmm. and how it all returned to right. that. And and that was, I mean, that came out of every conversation, <laughs> and it, even with a young, I mean, the young law student who thought he knew everything, <laughs> found out later he didn't know very much. <laughs> So JB, how many years of research did you put into the book before you actually began to write it? Far more than that I anticipated having to do. It all started, of course, Leo would, would often talk about her early life, but not a lot of the details. She'd talk about experiences and inspirations she'd had as a child in England, and of course, but she always stressed that her life really began when she married Walter Russell or when she met Walter Russell. But in 1988, the year she refolded, we had a conference to sort of reacquaint people with the Russell works. She, she'd been not as active in the last several years. Out, it was out in Aspen. Tim Binder organized it. And I recall Richard had the enviable task of speaking on Walter Russell, giving a biographical speech on Walter Russell, and I was supposed to do one on Leo. Mm -hmm. Well, when I began to prepare one, I went to the people you might think wouldn't have known everything, Angela Carr and different, different ones, and I found just a dearth of material in public, nothing in publication except uh, Dr. Russell had written beautiful uh, story of, of much of her, many of her experiences in the atomic suicide front of that book. Right. And, but it was by no means a biography sure. equal to what, what Richard was given. And so I gilded the lily as best I could with, <laughs> with the most romantic background. And, and shortened it. And then I came back to Virginia determined that I was going to work on a, do a definite and definitive biography of her. I felt it was necessary. I felt it was particularly, and I didn't realize how necessary until I got into some of his correspondence, which stressed the importance he gave to her in, in the whole life. Uh, in the whole story that they jointly told in the last uh, 17 or 18 years. So then, then you had the unenviable task of uh, figuring out that question mark prior mm -hmm. to her meeting Walter Russell, well, which you said earlier was, yeah. was very unknown, her, her past. Right. So. I, I wound up, uh, first of all, I went through all of the open files mm -hmm. at, at the university and the photographs. And, and even went through all of her books prior to her marriage to Walter Russell to see if there anything written in inscriptions, sure. this, that, and the other. And then, her sister had passed away by then. She had a nephew in, in England mm -hmm. who had only been with her two or three times in America. Mm -hmm. And for a summer, when he was 16 years old, he's a Boy Scout of uh, is this Peter? Uh, yeah, Peter. Yeah. A Boy Scout uh, executive. Have you spoken with him before? I haven't. I haven't. He's a very nice person, lovely wife. Mm -hmm. So I arranged to go to England. I used to, I was traveling fairly often over there. Then uh, uh, on a, Byron is a, a sort of interest of mine. I was for a while there, president of the Byron Associated Society of America. There are 28 societies, mm -hmm. and of course England is where it all starts, oh, wow. okay. and so we'd all go back there. And I was able to work in a good deal of research. I had a marvelous 
research uh, lady who does uh, work for, I can't recall, one of the murder missions, Mary Higgins Clark, mm -hmm. uh, to make certain there are no uh, misstatements of fact, you know, in the sure. background of those, those mysteries. And it, was, it certainly was a help to me because she opened many doors. And I found lucky, I was lucky, I found things like during the 10 years before she became an American citizen, she had to fill a form out where she lived each month and where she worked each month. And that was a godsend because it allowed me, once I got into correspondence, to, to know if something were dated, was not dated, you know. And the, I guess what really got me, when I thought the book was all done, Angela told me one day, she said, well, you know, there are 150 boxes in the attic of correspondence <laughs> from, uh, and plus her trunks from England. Oh, wow. And so that just opened the whole thing up. Right. And, uh, you just can't imagine how it did. So, so it went from a 250-page yeah. book to double that? That's right. right. And, and it took 14 years, probably. Wow. I, had, I was practicing law during the time, and I had the, the death efforts. in the family and all at the time. Wow. And, and so, but still, the wonderful thing about it, in the last few years, whenever anyone wrote, a copy of that letter and a copy of Ms. Russell's reply stapled together and filed by Angela. And I, I just can't tell you how valuable that was. Sure, great and, then, and then the work, I, I suppose nobody did any, any more to help me piece together certain parts in America, the, the, that part of the story, than um, Sam and Martha Spiker, because they had been so much part of it, right. and so devoted to her. She married him up there at the, at the, at the wedding picture is in uh, the book. And I must say, Martha looks, I can't say it quite for Sam, but Martha looks just as young <laughs> as she did on the wedding day. And Sam doesn't look bad. But anyway, it, it took 14 years, there's no question, and I tried to, to not to clutter it, some, some people think it's long, but I, I wanted to, I just figured there'd never be another biography of Leo. Right. And I wanted to get across as much as I possibly could of significance. Sure. And, and I hope I did. Well, I found, I found the, the letters and the correspondence to be one of the, my more favorite parts of the book because it really lays out the, the personal qualities of, of that communication and, and how seriously they took it and how each letter was tailored to each person. There wasn't a, just a standard formal reply as you see with so many uh, organizations today. Every response was very personalized, very Absolutely. tailored to, to that situation. If you, and it was all handwritten, which is, which is another amazing <laughs> thing. Everything's computers these days, so I don't think anybody yeah. could quite do a correspondence uh, the, effort like she did. And in her the state. beautiful handwriting and all exactly. that. Exactly. But if you, if you, if you asked a personal question, a unique problem troubling you, she answered it for you in, in, a, in a way that was different from the way she spoke with it to anyone else, but just as sincere and, and tailored Mm -hmm. to you and and she dealt with all the great problems of the of the of the day the social issues that are before us now right. she, she advised people on and, and it, is, it was a, it's, you know it was a very inspiring thing mm -hmm. and uh, uh, one of my own personal questions I'd like to know a little more about you mentioned um, a lot. In fact, it's probably the most detail I've, I've seen of how they worked with NORAD and Raytheon briefly. Uh, we've recently seen some documents come to light uh, of their correspondences with Raytheon and, and NORAD. Can you tell us anything about Walter's and Leo's uh, research and, and how you dug around into finding out those things? It was almost entirely through correspondence on that. There, there were, um, and Tim Binder helped a great deal. Right. He was at the time writing his book 
on the uh, scientific drawings mm -hmm. in believe right. you know and mm -hmm. and uh, and there were records of a number of experiments at the time that we had a little publication that we put out on Fulcrum, Fulcrum magazine, Fulcrum yeah. magazine. Mm -hmm. And and I give full credit to the, to the people who edited that and mm -hmm. and, uh, and to Tim, and it was um, certainly I'm no scientist, mm -hmm. but it was it was there for the taking. I don't know that they quite finished right. some of the work, and he, he was quite uh, elderly, mm -hmm. but others seem to have uh, vindicated all of the theories. That's great. I mean, haven't you found? <laughs> well, I'll ask you a question. We're, we're actually working with a, a coil maker named Ben Palmer from Berlin, who has taken it on his own to to produce several coils and sent some to a, a gentleman by the name of Chris Plouffe in, I believe, Pennsylvania, and also is sending me a set of coils. And basically, what we're going to do is open source it and, and try to show that the conical motion of electricity produces the direct cube ratio of the squ square to, you know, multiply by the square ratio um, directly to the center. So you start with 8 volts, you end up with some derivative of that, but maybe 512. Right. So if, if we can prove that empirically and with experimentation documented and videotaped, then it will definitely go further to to show how the science of nature right. actually works. So now, isn't it keeping our fingers crossed. Yes, yeah, it's, but it's amazing that that's being done. Mm -hmm. uh, still being done. What? How many years after he passed away? Right. Oh, goodness. Well, he, his message and, and his ideas of nature and how it works are so inspiring that mm -hmm. that people are just coming on board voluntarily from the inspiration alone, and that's you know one thing uh, you know love to see more in science is a voluntary open-mindedness to sure. embrace the work of such he, he a He would person. have liked to have seen that too. Yes. And all that correspondence in for, the New York Times. For how many years I've uh, been, you know, <laughs> but, yeah. I know he had mentioned in, in the secret of working on with God that, that science took his universal one and threw it in the wastebasket. You know, laughed at it, scoffed at it, but um, Maybe it'll help them to know in the, in the rest of the still magnetic light that there are many people coming on board and trying to further his research as he understood it. So. I never found the letter from Einstein, but I found reference to it yeah, from other correspondents that. That, that Einstein's a commentary that uh, Walter Russell had intuited the atomic age. Really? Yeah. That would be great to see sometime. I think it's quoted in the book, not to, but I didn't have it. You did mention a gentleman who had spoken with Einstein yes. prior to his, his death, and he had expressed regret that he hadn't studied more of Walter that's, Russell's that's, science. So That's right. That's supposed, I mean, that's, that's what the correspondence showed. Wow. Uh -huh. But it was, it, it was... It was very interesting to go into all that. I'm, I'm not a physicist or, sure. or a scientist, but and I use the lawyer's prerogative to <laughs> to talk rather, rather than to prove. <laughs> and and I, I tried to put the points across, but it, it's one of the great joys of my life that I was able to produce a biography of, sure. of Leo that I, I think one thing about it that it, I don't know if you recall the last scene, but I had the opportunity. There, there was a there was a gentleman who was the son of of uh, Flory, mm -hmm. her Leo's sister's right. uh, husband, her stepson, and he had. Um, after the war, he'd become an engineer. Second World War, he'd become an engineer in Canada, mm -hmm. and he knew Leo so well when they were young. When he, when uh, she was a kid sister, so to speak, of, of Flory, and she would take him out croqueting, or if I've forgotten what to, you know, recreation and mm -hmm. all around. And anyway, he knew her when she became famous. Uh, for her beauty products, mm -hmm. and of course we haven't talked about the fact that during that time she lived in in the British Hollywood, mm -hmm. right next to, door to the 
top producer of British films, right. Walter Micron, right. mm -hmm. and and wanted so desperately to break into films, and she right. did later in Hollywood the same way, um, but uh, was always invariably told that her personality was so intense, it was very difficult for her to absorb herself into character. But anyway, she but when, he knew her through all these eras, and of course they were exciting times. Mm -hmm. Then he remembered her coming to America, and after he settled in Canada in later years, he would come to Florida every year with his wife. They always st would stop at Swanano and have a marvelous reception. And he was, I finally got in touch with him in England. He was 86 or 7, and he, had an afflicted wife, his wife was ill, and he was pretty much confined to the apartment to look after her. And, but he, we had long conversations on several occasions. And when he summarized, I asked him just to summarize what he, because you've sort of done it for me, and I guess he was a little more effective than I've been in summarizing. I said, how would you summarize uh, this lady you knew from the time you were a boy of 10 or 12, all through her time in, the, in the Elstree, the British Hollywood, and as a famous uh, purveyor of, of beauty uh, secrets, on down through the years in New York, Boston, and, and at Swannanoa. And he, he, his response was, she was the kindest person I ever knew. Now I thought that was most remarkable to say. Right. And uh, it 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 uh, it says all that's, that's how you close the book. That, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Not to give it away, but yeah. there's there's plenty of yeah. material in there that, that anyone can read and and to really get an understanding understanding of, of the humanistic value of, a, of an illuminated person. And, um, so in closing, let's uh, let's uh, maybe ask uh, what your fondest memory of, of Swan and Ella and Leo Russell is, in, in sense of your own experience. Maybe the the most uh, uh, the greatest epiphany you might have ever had while on the mountain, or in your own personal terms of studying the science or the philosophy. What what is your greatest? Uh, lesson that you've been able to take. Well, I, I'm convinced that it's very, very accurate that, that the, uh, the sense of, of creation as it is, the sense of, of, of our existence is very well put forth by, by them in, a, in an understandable way. Right. Uh, perhaps not all the scientific uh, nuances, but it's, it's, it's so clear that uh, if you give, you receive. And if you give with kindness and, and, and lack of selfishness, and I mean, they, they would admit, freely admitted they weren't the first to state that. Sure. But they certainly did it effectively and they exemplified they it. They lived it. They lived it. They really did. And I, I there's far too many times to remember one explicit one. Sure. I think possibly, well, I never had an unhappy time up there. Let's put it that way. Whether, I was, whether I was invited to dinner, that big dining room table that she brought and put right across the top of the uh, staircase right. so you could look down over that window, that had belonged to Mark Hanna, who was a great American political leader that was sort of a kingmaker for several of the late 19th century presidents, I right. think McKinley and different ones. And the daughter or granddaughter who gave that table to Leo said, just as the leaders of the country gathered around this, hopefully someday the leaders of the world could gather around uh, in the cause of peace. Right. And, and that was sort of a lofty thing, but dropping down from that, sitting around that table with just a great group of, of cheerful, happy people, the yard man or somebody who'd worked the summer out in the grounds 
and Angela who worked night and day and some of a couple who had come in after just reading the books, whoever was there was just embraced in the in the whole uh, atmosphere. Right. And it, it it was tremendous. Like I said, I never had a bad time. But up there at all, or, or and I never saw her do an unkind thing, and she was so the way she would would uh, meet people and greet people. I learned an awful lot from her. I'm very ineffective as far as uh, in comparison, but the, she just it, it was just an incredible person. You you realized you was were, were with a, a very very unusual individual and who just seemed to exemplify what we always talked about as the light. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking this opportunity to sit down and talk with all of us. And, um, um, I recommend right. thoroughly to anyone to get a thorough understanding of who Leo Russell was, formerly born Daisy Grace Cook, uh, Remembered for Love by J.B. Allen III. J.B., thank you so much. Thank you for coming. It's wonderful to, to have you all here. And I'm so happy that uh, that, that occasion you visited Swannanoa four years ago has, has had such marvelous fruit. And I think the, the future is yet to be beheld and it's going to be a marvelous one to produce this message Absolutely. across the world. Well, I look Thank to, you. look forward to working with you again and uh, hopefully we can get some funding to do a very professional studio grade documentary on the lives of Walter and Leo Russell and uh, get yeah. you together again with all of us and it would be a professional environment and, and thank you so much for being your home and, and uh, agreeing to meet with us. Been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.